Today we'll resume our discussion on uh, sulfate attack. In the last class, we saw how uh, sulfates penetrate the cementitious system, interact with the hydrated cement phases, and form different kinds of compounds starting from the surface to the interior. Uh, let's talk a little bit about whether ettringite formation causes expansion. Now, of course, we know very well that ettringite has a structure which is prone to expansion, primarily by imbibing the moisture. And this expansion can lead to stresses in the surrounding environment that causes cracking, right. But what is the direct evidence and what are the conditions under which ettringite will lead to form, uh, expansion in the concrete system? Now, we know that primary ettringite is the ettringite that actually forms very early in the process. So, in a regular cement hydration, when cement uh, phases like the aluminates react with the sulphate that are added in, into the cement, we form the early ettringite. And this early ettringite later converts to monosulphate because there is an excess of aluminate present in the system, right. Now, there is also an evidence of late primary ettringite forming and that happens in cements where more sulphate is available. So, that means you continue to deposit ettringite for a fairly long substantial period of time, okay. Now, this happens because of internal sources of sulphates. External ettringite is when we have sulphates coming in from external environments due to penetration of sulphate from the outside. Apart from that, we can also call delayed ettringite formation as a phenomenon which looks at the formation of internally suppressed ettringite which grows at later ages. So, this means that ettringite because of some reasons did not form at the early stages and some other kind of combination of factors has led it to form in a hardened state. Obviously, when an expansive material forms inside the hardened concrete, that is when you have major damage because of that. And that is also known as DEF or delayed ettringite formation, okay. That is a common terminology that is given for de delayed ettringite formation. Truly speaking, any sulphate attack process leads to formation of ettringite in the late hardened stages. So, any formation of ettringite is secondary ettringite formation. That means, we are distinguishing it from the primary ettringite that forms due to regular hydration of the cement, okay. Now, if you look at the type of crystalline material that is formed because of production of ettringite, ettringite is known to form in the needle shape, right. It forms like needles which has a long dimension and basically what happens is the length to thickness ratio of the ettringite depends on the pH of the surrounding environment. Now, it turns out that when you have very high pH levels, we are not really forming very long needles of ettringite, we are forming shorter stubby ettringite crystals, okay. But somewhere in between, between 12 and 10, we are actually forming ettringite needles which have very high lengths, okay. So, what would happen is in the early stages of cement hydration, you would actually form these microcrystalline ettringite where the length is actually quite small, okay, and length to diameter or rather length to thickness ratio is quite small. But when the ettringite expands, you can, uh, you can think about a scenario when you have an external sulphate attack and ex ettringite expansion where moisture is being imbibed and ettringite actually expand, it may actually ex start exhibiting the crystal habit that is shown by a higher length, okay. So, microcrystalline ettringite at high pH levels is seen in fresh concrete, what we typically expect in early hydration, right. Now, according to researchers and this has been well documented that microcrystalline ettringite with water absorption capability leads to high expansions, okay. And this generally happens when the pH conditions are fairly high. So, if you come to as uh, 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 sulphate exposures where the pH is brought down, for example, when you have lower pH levels in the surrounding environment, then it may turn out that the ettringite that is actually formed in the system may not be highly absorptive. And when this ettringite does not absorb or imbibe water, it does not lead to very high expansions. So, ettringite formation can lead to expansion primarily only in those conditions where the external pH is also high enough. Now, this explains to a large extent why we do not really see expansions happening in field based specimens. In lab specimens, we see a very high level of expansion, but the, at the same time in the actual performance in the field, which is accompanied by continuous replenishment of the attacking solution because you have the ground water which is continually recharging the attacking solution. In addition to that, we also have uh, the presence of other ionic species that may bring down the pH of the surrounding solution. Now, when that happens, the ettringite that is actually forming may not end up being as reactive or rather as expansive 
as what forms inside the system in a regular immersion condition. So what happens when you take a beaker and put a sulphate solution inside and put a concrete specimen inside? So concrete is having a very high pH, right? 13. So what is happening when you put it inside a sulphate solution of pH 7 or 8? You will have a leaching of the lime from the concrete into the outside environment, okay? And the pH of the outside solution starts getting stabilized to a very high level. We get to a level greater than 12 in some cases. So in those conditions, the ettringite that is actually forming is of an expansive nature. When you have high pH in the surrounding solution, ettringite is expansive and that may lead to the expansions that is typically associated with sulphate attack in the laboratory studies. But in the field, we do not see the same kind of expansions. And the stability of ettringite also is dependent on the pH levels that are existing in a particular environment. So here, for example, when the pH is very high, or the pH in the range of between 9 and 13 and that is generally the range of stability of a ettringite solution. So again, different researchers have provided various ranges of pH across which ettringite is stable. When the surrounding conditions become acidic, in that environment ettringite may not be very stable. So you have to look at the existing conditions around to check whether ettringite is going to be stable. So in an acidic environment, for example, the ettringite may actually readily convert to gypsum, aluminum hydroxide right especially if there is carbonation also happening you may actually form calcium carbonate phases along with aluminum hydroxide and gypsum. So ettringite in an acidic environment will convert to gypsum and aluminum hydroxide. So again if you look at uh, the evidence from the field the structures that remain completely dry there is ab absolutely no ettringite detected in hardened concrete okay. So, if you are not having any moisture, you are not really seeing the formation of ettringite at the later stages. And when you have alt alternate drying and wetting, there is some ettringite that is seen, but because of the drying, you will probably not have a condition where the ettringite formation causes expansion. Now, I will just show you some recent lab studies which will show you the relationship between ettringite formation and expansion. So in lab studies, typically we study using mortar prismatic specimens which are uh, typically 25 by 25 by 285 millimeters and these are stored inside the sulphate solutions completely immersed inside sulphate solutions and periodically the specimens are removed from the solution and the length is measured using a length comparator which is shown here, okay. So this is uh, prisms prepared with mortar stored in 3 grams and 50 gram per liter sulphate solutions. In this case it was sodium sulphate. So you do not expect any secondary mechanisms arising out of the cation effect like we discussed earlier with magnesium you have the effect of the cation also that is quite serious to be considered, okay. So what we did in this project was we were periodically monitoring the length change and also we were doing quantification of the ettringite by X-ray diffraction analysis. So here this is uh, showing you the extent of expansion that is happening with different mortar specimens over 32 weeks of exposure and these are two mixes, one was, is with uh, ordinary Portland cement and M2 is with Portland porcelain cement, that means cement which has 30 percent fly ash in it. So you can see that after 32 weeks, the only specimens that showed substantial expansion were the OPC concrete or OPC mortar specimens which were stored in the high concentration sulphate solution, okay. In 3 gram per liter solution, you did not really have too much of an expansion, although there was some increasing trend that was seen towards the later part of the storage, okay. Now when you look at the change in dynamic modulus, dynamic modulus here was measured actually by ascertaining the resonant frequency of the material. So we took the prismatic specimens and le looked at the resonant frequency. So what happens in concrete is as the deterioration of concrete happens, the resonant frequency also will reduce, okay. So this is dynamic modulus indirectly measured using a non-destructive test. So here you can see for the mortar specimen that was stored in the high concentration sulphate solution, ordinary potent cement based mortar you can see that the dynamic modulus reduced significantly in the 32 weeks of exposure while all the other specimens seem to have a fairly consistent dynamic modulus without any decrease, okay. So let us look at the uh, quantification now. This is again the percentage expansion presented as a table rather than as a figure. Now if you can see the OPC 50 gram per liter, the expansion was almost as high as 3 percent. That is a very high level of expansion, okay. When you do this ASTM test, this is as per ASTM C1012. When you do this test method for typical mortars, okay, if your uh, expansion crosses 0.1 percent, 
okay, within a period of six months of exposure, you term that mortar or that particular combination of binder and mortar as not being resistant to sulphate solutions. Okay, that's only an arbitrary sort of an approach. It does not really bring out the true behavior that you can expect from concrete in a sulphate rich environment. But in this continuous Im immersion test, if your specimen ends up having an expansion of more than 0.1 percent within six months, then it's supposed to be a cement not resistant to sulphate attack. However, in this case, expansions as high as 3 percent were recorded in just 32 weeks of, ex of exposure. So, that's about 8 months, 7 to 8 months of exposure, you had 3 percent. Okay? If you look at 3 gram per liter OPC, it still not reached that 0.1 percent mark. Okay? Whereas, when you have 50 gram per liter solution and PPC based mortar, it is still less than 0 0.1 percent, the expansion is still le less than 0.1 percent. PPC in 3 grams per litre, the expansion is barely anything, I mean it is almost hardly noticeable. You can see there is hardly any change from the time of immersion to the last measurement that was done. Okay, so, how does this translate into the ettringite content that is actually forming in the system? So, now X-ray diffraction was done to detect the phases that were present, only the crystalline phases and between the crystalline phases, the amount of ettringite was also determined. So, again here the ettringite amount is given in this row here. Okay. You can see that there is a steady increase in the quantity of ettringite that is forming with increase in the time of exposure from 9 weeks to 25 weeks. Okay. So, what we did was we sort of uh, plotted, so we plotted the ettringite content determined from X-ray diffraction. Okay. This was only percentage of all the crystalline components that were actually present versus the percentage of expansion and you can see it is a fairly well defined relationship. Okay. So, this is a set of points that were taken from the intermediate readings that we had taken in this process. So, this clearly shows that there is some evidence that then in a continuous immersion study, the expansion is very much dictated by the amount of ettringite that is actually forming in the system. Okay. But then again, whether this translates into reality or not depends on the con conditions existing around the concrete structure, whether we are in an environment where the pH is always high or whether we are in an environment where the pH is low where other forms of ettringite can actually happen or when ettringite can actually decompose to other products which may not be actually causing the level of expansion that we associate with that ettringite. Uh, of course, we engineers always like to see some models, see the linear or quadratic or something fitted through the data. So, this is just to satisfy that uh, requirement. So, you see here with uh, the 50 gram per liter solution, the OPC mortar is showing you a very high level of expansion and again if you fit that into a quadratic uh, sort of a relationship you can get the constants associated with the quadratic equation. Similarly, for the 3 gram per liter solution, again the fit is quite good with the quadratic relationship, but then again where is it, what is this leading you towards? It may help you to some extent in predicting the time at which the expansion will exceed a certain critical value. Okay, although that cr critical value is stated as 0.1 percent in ASTM C1012, you can decide based upon the kind of conditions prevailing in your site what you want that critical expansion to be. Okay? So, based on that you can suitably modify the test and suggest a different uh, way of interpreting the data. Now, in this case there is no shrinkage happening. So, in this case shrinkage is totally avoided because your specimens are continuously inside the sulphate solution. So, there is no drying and wetting in this case. So, when you do drying and wetting, the specimen stays inside the solution for a certain period of time, then you have it in a drying environment and then you put it back into the system. So, that may produce a, a net length change which could, which could also go towards shrinkage. Okay, of course, uh, talking about various means of protecting your mortars or concretes against sulphate attack, the first and foremost is the use of low C3 cements because again, we have seen very clearly the link between expansion and ettringite formation, but low C3 cements tend to change the chemistry in such a way that the primary ettringite that forms in the early hydration process remains stable throughout. It does not convert to other forms of sulphate like monosulphate which have the tendency of reconversion to ettringite when external sulphates come into the concrete. Okay? So, low C3 cements form the basis for sulphate resistant cements, we call it SRC or sulphate resistant cement. Okay? Now, it is also useful to have a cement that is low in C3S and that is from the point of view of production of calcium hydroxide upon hydration. You know very well that one mole of C3S produces three times as much calcium hydroxide as compared to C2S. So, if you have more calcium hydroxide, there is greater tendency to form 
gypsum because when external sulfates react with calcium hydroxide you form gypsum right. So reduction in gypsum formation can also help improve the resistance of the concrete or mortar to sulfate attack. High alumina cements and super sulfated cements are not really utilized in a large extent uh, today uh, primarily because of the other problems we talked about that they have related to the stability of the hydrated phases. Now in terms of sulfate exposure uh, both these cements perform very well because again there is no formation of late ettringite that actually happens in these systems. Okay. Now of course we are mainly left with two major aspects that probably would form part of most protection mechanisms when we talk about durability related problems. One is use of personalic materials and mineral earth mixtures. Now this can be advantageous in most cases because it brings down the extent of calcium hydroxide that is there in the system. So less gypsum is forming. If there is less gypsum forming obviously there will be less conversion of the existing monosulphate and aluminate to ettringite because as we discussed earlier gypsum formation happens to be the first step in the process. So if you are trying to restrict that step the next step will not take place automatically okay. So you have, you have less gypsum that means good for sodium sulphate. Now what happens when you have uh, less calcium hydroxide present in the system when you have a acidic sort of a mechanism which is brought about like let us say by magnesium sulphate what will happen in that case. So concretes with mineral admixtures which have lower portlandite contents how will they face magnesium sulphate solutions will they be good or bad as compared to OPC they will be worse okay. As far as magnesium sulphate is concerned any attack any sulphate based attack which produces acidic conditions in the system so SCMs will be poor in terms of the resistance. Now of course we are only addressing here the uh, me uh, chemical mechanism, we are not truly really addressing the physical mechanism of sulphate penetration which is dictated by the permeability of the system. Now when you use SEMs real concrete specimens in the field which are exposed to sulphate solutions will tend to resist to a large extent the penetration of the sulphate solution inside. Now chemically the absence of calcium hydroxide in mi mineral admixture based concretes may be a negative aspect as far as magnesium sulphate attack is concerned but as far as physical penetration of the attack solution is concerned that is going to be limited to a large extent because of the lower permeability in the system okay. But then if you look at chemical studies which are done as far as sulphate attack is concerned with magnesium sulphate most often you will find that the performance of concrete with mineral additives is not very good and that is something we will see later in acid attack studies also but of course the most important characteristic that we still need to worry about is maintaining a low water cement ratio in the concrete and making concrete impermeable that is probably the first line of a defense that you can give against penetration of sulphate solutions. Now this is some laboratory evidence about the influence of C3A in sulphate attack and this is uh, from Canada. So here you can see very clearly that if you have a very high percentage C3A in your cement 12.3 percent C3A you cannot even make out what type of specimens these were okay these specimens were completely immersed in sulphate solutions and here you have 3.5 percent C3A the cylindrical specimens are actually intact after exposure to the high concentration sulphate solutions. So C3A directly because of the kind of studies that we do in laboratory based on immersion you can clearly see the performance of concrete with less C3A to be much superior as compared to the performance of concrete with higher C3A. Now when you go to real site based studies the best example of this kind of a study is uh, what was carried out by the Portland Cement Association PCA okay, in the US. They had a study which lasted for several decades nearly 30 to 40 years of data they collected on these uh, concrete specimens that were actually immersed in Colorado inside sulphate rich soils as well as these specimens that were immersed inside Medicine Lake in South Dakota which had a high sulphate content. So these were partially immersed to bring out the uh, realistic effects what could happen on the concrete when they are in a sulphate rich soil okay. Interestingly what their study showed very clearly was that any concrete with water cement ratio of more than 0.45 was damaged in this exposure. So this was realistic exposure the sulphate solution was not highly concentrated it was actually what was found in reality. The concrete specimens are not extremely small they were fairly large cylinders and after 7 years of exposure they came up with this conclusion that any concrete 
with more than 0.45 water cement ratio was damaged. That is quite interesting to show that 0.45 is the limiting water cement ratio as far as sulphate rich environments are concerned and this 0.45 reflects in most of the codal specifications also. In terms of protection of concrete against sulphate, the first and foremost thing that is prescribed in specifications is reduction of water cement ratio to less than 0.45. And again this uh, same data was actually analyzed later by researchers at uh, University of California Berkeley who presented this data in a different uh, approach later. So, the time before failure was plotted against the water to cement ratio and what they were able to show is the concretes that were safe even after 40 years, okay, even after 40 years the concrete that still remained safe irrespective of the C3A content of the cement, all these concretes had water cement ratios of less than 0 0.45. So, even if there was a high C3A cement available in the system, if the water cement ratio was kept below 0.45, the performance was still very good. So, all concretes that survived beyond 40 years were the ones which had water cement ratio less than 0.45. And again, if you look at most uh, specifications, the cement limits basically talk more about the extent of C3A present in the system, okay, where type 2 cements is tip are typically the moderate sulphate resistant cements. So, they have about 8 percent C3A. Type 3 generally will have high C3A content because we need the rapid hardening characteristics from these cements. But type 5 cements which are sulphate resistant cements, I am talking about ASTM specifications here. Type 5 is sulphate resistant cement and there the C3A content should be controlled by less than 5 percent. Okay. But problem is most type 5 cements are never tested for sulphate resistance. Assuming that you are always having C3A less than 5 percent, people assume that when you use a C3, uh, sulphate resistant cement you automatically get protected from sulphate attack. Now, why is this a problem? Why should we still conduct tests for sulphate resistance even if we have sulphate resistant cement? Yeah, because we are not really establishing the mix design clearly if we do not choose the water cement ratio that is one thing. Second is we know that there are other forms of damage also happening in the system related to physical uh, salt attack related to gypsum formation right? and the other aspect that ettringite may not be the dominant mechanism of failure in actual concrete specimens. In a laboratory study where we do continuous immersion, the formation of ettringite we can clearly show is directly linked to the expansion. But in a realistic condition, ettringite may not be stable first of all, it may convert to other forms of sulphate and it may not really be the dominant mechanism of damage to your structure. So, even when you use type 5 cements, we should expose it to sulphate related uh, tests and ascertain whether we are actually getting the performance that we desire which is why the testing standard for sulphates that is ASTM C1012 which is based on a continuous immersion that is questioned by many researchers. It is not really bringing out truly speaking the actual resistance to sulphate attack for the concrete because we are not truly incorporating the effects of the permeability of the system. Anyway, that is beyond the discussion that we would like to have here. Just wanted to recapitulate the different testing methods that are prescribed in the ASTM standards. What is most often used is ASTM C1012, where you have mortar bars which are exposed to 5 percent sodium sulphate or 5 percent magnesium sulphate or they even say you can also use a mixture of sodium and magnesium sulphate. Now, the kind of mechanisms or kind of the reactions that you get from these would be quite different. So, you have to be very careful about how you are actually going about doing the test. Selection of the right sulphate solution is very important. And expansion is measured typically for 6 or 12 months after the concrete or mortar actually attains 20 mega Pascals only it is exposed to the sulphate solution. That is to ensure that there is some minimum level of strength that has been developed already in the system. So, again the test solution is 50 gram per litre sodium sulphate solution and again this 20 mega Pascals allows the supplementary cementing materials also to react. So, that means we are not saying that we only cure for 7 days. In 7 days OPC may react to a different degree as compared to fly ash. So, what we say is until all the specimens attain the same level of strength only after that we expose them to the sulphate solution. Now, the other kind of sulphate related mechanisms that you may see on the field also include what is called salt crystallization. So, we talked already about the fact that columns embedded in sulphate rich soils will actually have more damage at the soil air interface rather than 
in the part of the column that is actually completely submerged inside the soil. Okay. And that is essentially because of this additional effect of salt crystallization. Okay. And salt crystallization basically relates to the deposition of the salts inside the pores, evaporation of the water and subsequent crystallization of the salt. Okay. And you can see that when you change between different forms of the sulphate that leads to a change in the expansion or change in the levels of uh, the crystallization levels because you are incorporating waters of hydration the size of the crystal also changes because of which you generate crystallization pressure in the system. And added to this you have the other aspects of we talked about the evaporative transport that is wick action that is quite dominant in cases such as this when you have wetting on one side and completely dry environment on the other side. Okay. Interestingly it is again shown by research that if you have water cement ratio less than 0.45 in your system the rate of evaporative transport that means the rate at which the suction will happen diminishes significantly. So this 0.45 seems to make sense not just from a chemical point of view but also from a physical attack point of view. Again these are evidences of salt crystallization from Portland Cement Association and this is actually a long term study done by PCA for concretes which had type 5 cement that means both were made with sulphate resistant cement. One had a very high water cement ratio of 0 0.65, the other had 0 0.39 and you can see very clearly the performance. After 12 years the visual rating of concrete was 5 that means it had deteriorated to the maximum level. Okay. Here after 16 years the concrete was still having a rating of 2 that means it had a long way to go before it got com completely deteriorated. Okay. So again what has been shown in most sulphate related research studies is that the role of water cement ratio is critically important not just the C3A level but water cement ratio is the primary factor that determines sulphate resistance. Now a different type of sulphate attack is delayed at ring head formation. Okay. So how was this discovered or investigated in concrete for the first time? It happened when uh, some railway sleepers in the UK sh started showing some cracks. Now railway sleepers are produced in a precast yard typically these are pre-stressed precast railway sleepers and they are subjected typically to heat, heat curing to increase the rate of strength development. And uh, these sleepers started showing kind of map cracking or random cracking after about 15 to 20 years of service. So the people who investigated thought that this was because of alkali silica reactivity but then they later saw that the reactive aggregate was not really there in the system and these cracks had to be associated with something else. So when they started doing microstructural analyses they found that these uh, concretes were actually showing the uh, uh, formation of lot of ettringite in the system and lot of this ettringite had actually started occupying the sites of the cracks and the voids. I okay, will show you some pictures which a, a little bit later. So the, this is the interface between cement paste and aggregate you can see a lot of ettringite that is deposited in this interface and also you can see ettringite all across the interface in several of these uh, around several of these aggregates you actually see the formation of ettringite. Okay. So this was detected in the microstructural study and then they came to a conclusion that this ettringite was something that had reformed in the system after the concrete was hardened because it could not form in the initial stages. Okay. And this initial stage suppression of ettringite formation happens primarily because of the heat curing of the system. If you are providing a very high level of heat to the system we are generally talking about temperatures more than 70, 75 degrees Celsius at that stage the formation of ettringite gets suppressed. Okay. Or if you have sulphates which are probably not of a type that are easily soluble, if the sulphates are not easily soluble in the beginning then you would probably do not have the formation of ettringite in the early stages as you have in normal concrete. Okay. So, Ettringite formation is suppressed primarily when you have high temperatures as, as in steam cured concretes. If you have very low solubility of sulphates in the system then again ettringite formation could be suppressed. So what happens to these sulphates which are not released early enough is that they go into the CSH. The sulphates are getting absorbed by the CSH. Indeed if you take heat cured cements or heat cured concretes you will see very clearly when you do an analysis of the CSH that it contains a lot of sulphur in it. Okay. And this sulphate would have otherwise gone into reaction products like ettringite or monosulphate. So these sulphates that go into CSH later recombine with the aluminates whenever moisture is available to form ettringite in the hardened concrete and that leads to expansive pressures that causes cracking of your concrete. 
So, again this is some evidence of uh, concrete which was heat cured showing ettringite formation in the interfacial transition zone. Now, interestingly a lot of the research that showed mi microstructural evi evidence showed that ettringite was actually forming in the ITZ and also in cracks and inside large voids. So, is, this void is entirely filled with ettringite. So, this led many researchers to believe that the mechanism of formation of ettringite required that apart from the late release of sulphates the other condition that had to be satisfied was the presence of micro cracks and voids in the system. That is what researchers tended to believe earlier, but later upon subsequent understanding of this phenomenon people have come to an agreement that it is not the ettringite that forms in the pores and voids that leads to expansion, it is the ettringite that forms within the CSH that causes expansion. Okay. So, this CSH here which has very little space for the ettringite to form and expand that is where if the ettringite forms it creates an expansion and after expansion happens and the cracks occur the ettringite from here starts going to zones where it can nucleate and grow and forms much larger deposits for example, into the voids and into the interfacial transition zone where there is more porosity available in the system. Okay. So, the formation of ettringite in pores, voids and cracks of the manifestation of the later part of your delayed ettringite formation where the ettringite recrystallizes into these pores and voids. So, the primary ettringite because of DEF still forms within the CSH okay. and then you get expansive pressures and then finally ettringite moves to the zones where it can nucleate and grow in a very large extent. Okay. So, again this is uh, this was a topic of debate amongst researchers earlier, but later it was clearly showed that ettringite formation within CSH causes cracking and then ettringite redeposits in the cracks leading people to believe that actually it formed there in the first place. So, DEF is it really a problem? It is not as long as you control the temperature to less than 70 degrees in your concrete. Now, we often know that the temperature of steam curing you can definitely control by reducing the temperature of steam to less than 70, but the issue is because of cement contents being very high in the concrete during the early stages of hydration when you add heat curing to it the internal temperatures may actually rise to much more than 70. So, we have to be extremely careful when we are doing heat curing of concretes especially high performance concretes which have much higher cement contents and lower water to cement ratios. Okay. But when we are dealing with high performance concretes you also have to look at the other aspect. The fact that there is very little porosity in the system would not permit much mo moisture to enter this type of a concrete. If there is mo no moisture available ettringite expansion will not really happen in the system. So, automatically if you choose a concrete with low water cement ratio it will be resistant to DEF irrespective of the early stage uh, processes that you adapt in the system. Okay. Using pozzolanic materials also helps, why is that? Again we bring down the porosity and permeability of the system okay. and then we are again creating conditions of pH which are slightly lower as compared to what we have with plain Portland cement. So, ettringite formation in pozzolanic concretes may not lead to as much expansion as it leads in regular cementitious concretes. Okay. So, there are beneficial effects of adding pozzolanic materials. First of all you reduce the amount of aluminate available which can form ettringite that is a direct effect also when you have pozzolanic materials you reduce the amount of aluminate that can form ettringite. So, automatically ettringite formation is reduced when you have pozzolanic materials inside the system. Okay, moving on to other forms of chemical attack. So, we talked extensively about sulphate. If you look at chloride attack, we are not really bothered too much about how concrete gets deteriorated by chloride, but we are more worried about how this chloride can actually penetrate into the concrete and reach the level of reinforcing steel where it causes corrosion of the steel. So, products of chloride attack or chloride reaction with cementitious hydration products does not lead to expansion in the system. The kind of products that form actually do not cause expansion, although the kind of reaction is quite similar. Please remember the sulphate reaction you had C 3 A plus sulphate, here you have C 3 A plus chloride that will lead to the formation of chloroaluminate. C 3 A plus sulphate led to the formation of calcium sulfoaluminate, C 3 A plus chloride will form calcium chloroaluminate. So, one of the common forms of that is Friedel's salt, calcium chloroaluminate. ok. 
calcium chloroaluminate basically is a formation similar to the ettringite formation except that instead of sulphate you have chloride in the system. And this is actually a beneficial reaction because not only you are forming a non-expansive product, you are also trapping some of the chloride that got into your concrete, right. Chloride that gets into your concrete needs to be in the free condition to go and attack the steel surface. If the chlorides are getting bound by the cement, that means you are reducing the amount of chlorides that can cause corrosion. So, binding the chloride by C3A is a primary mechanism of protection against attack by chloride solutions. And this binding mechanism can actually get improved if you are substituting cement with mineral additives that have aluminates in them. For example, clay, you have slag, these are contributing a lot of aluminate into the system. And these aluminates can end up binding the chloride ions into a non-expansive product. In conclusion, when you have cements that are rich in C3A, you can actually have a good performance in chloride attack. In sulphate attack, we talked about low C3A. In chloride attack, it is the opposite. We need cements which have a high C3A because that is what will lead to improvement against resistance to corrosion. So, improvement in terms of resistance to corrosion, not against resistance. So, I am just showing you some pictures from magnesium chloride attack. So, again magnesium ion is also involved in this case. So, you will actually lead to the formation of this layer on the surface called brucite or magnesium hydroxide. Okay. And there is also evidence of Friedel salt formation which is marked by F here which is calcium chloroaluminate. Sometimes it forms in a condition that is mixed up with the CSH. So, you do not often find chloroaluminate directly as a single deposit. Sometimes it is mixed up with the CSH. Interestingly, what chlorides or chloride attack can do, can do is increase the porosity of your surface zones okay, because you are again leaching out your calcium hydroxide. So, you are removing a solid product and creating a porosity inside. Okay. So, because the extent of deposition of your other products is not as much, most of your products are soluble. For example, if your calcium hydroxide reacts with the chloride, what will it form? Calcium chloride, which is highly soluble and gets removed from the system. In the other case, sulphate attack, calcium hydroxide was reacting with sulphate to form gypsum and gypsum was not easily soluble. It was remaining in the system and showing up as deposits. Okay. So, here you are causing an increase in the porosity that could be one of the negative effects of chloride attack. But if you have uh, magnesium chloride attacking, apart from the increase in porosity, you also have the alteration of the surface and conversion of CSH into magnesium silicate hydrate. That can still happen in the system. Please remember it can happen in any system where you are removing calcium from the CSH. Here the magnesium will remove calcium from the CSH. If you have an acid, let us say if you have hydrochloric acid, the acidic conditions will remove calcium from the CSH. Even in that case, you will form silica hydrate, you will not form any metal metal based silicate hydrate. Okay. Here, since magnesium is present, you will form magnesium silicate hydrate. So, let us quickly talk about acid attack, then we will close for today. So, acid attack is primarily a problem in pipes carrying sewage. Concrete pipes that carry sewage are subjected to acid attack. Even in some industrial effluents, you can actually sometimes get acid formation. I will show you a, uh, some examples of where acids can be found. And when you talk about sewer pipes, the typical problem is related to the formation of sulfuric acid. And again, sulfuric acid you have sulphate, you have acidic conditions. So, you will essentially lead to gypsum formation. Would ettringite form? Not in the zones of which are close to surface. Wherever there is acid present, there will be no ettringite formation. Okay. So, because of ettringite not being stable at a low pH, you will not see any evidence of ettringite in the surface zones. If you go interior in the specimen where some sulphate may have actually penetrated, you may still see some ettringite formation. So, gypsum formation is a common phenomenon in sulphuric acid attack and what you do get from that is strength loss because of gypsum formation. And most importantly, you get loss of cementitious nature because your pH is lower that causes your CSH to become unstable. Now, sulphuric acid is just one type of acid that may damage concrete. There are several other instances which can actually happen. Industrial manufacturing often uses sulphuric acid, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid. So, all these can form or all these can damage the concrete structures that are used in these sorts of structures. Concrete sewer of course, is an environment where sulphuric acid at attack actually happens and that is microbially generated because of the action of bacteria. We will talk about that in just a minute. 
Industrial effluents can often carry acidic strains with them which can lead to damage to concrete linings for instance. Uh, interestingly, there is a lot of acids that are also generated from organic sources. So, silage production in cattle farms, okay. you can have cattle, cattle farms where a lot of organic acids can be generated like lactic acid, oxalic acid and so on. Okay. And sewage treatment plants are other locations where acid generation can actually happen in the system. Now, what is acid attack? Your primary reaction is simply a classic acid based reaction because you have acid from the external environment and your calcium hydroxide and other basic substances that are found inside the cement hydration products. So, essentially you are leading to a breakdown of the cement matrix microstructure by the formation of the salts. Okay. Some salts are soluble, some are insoluble. So, when you have soluble salts, you have increase in porosity. When you have insoluble salts, you have deposition and possibly expansion because of the deposition of these salts in the system. So, what happens in an acid attack? So, these are hydration products and you have the acid solution on the outside. So, you have anions of the acid as well as the proton, H plus proton which are penetrating the concrete. Whereas, you have the outward movement of the calcium bearing species, silicon and aluminum as well as your hydroxyl ions. And you have a zone that forms in between because of which, because of the interaction between the outward species and the inward moving species. And this zone basically is characterized by the type of material or type of acid that is attacking the system. So, what happens to your hydrated products? You end up with losing mass, you lose your integrity of the specimen, you lose the alkalinity and as a result there is a reduction in the strength and elastic modulus, there is an increase in porosity and finally, because the pH reduction can reach the level of the reinforcing steel, your acid attack will generally give rise to corrosion of reinforcement. Now, more specifically if you look at acid attack in concrete sewers, it is a very interesting problem because you have sewage which is typically carried in the lower half of your sewage pipe. Okay. And inside the sewage there is anaerobic bacteria or sulphate reducing bacteria that lead to the generation of hydrogen sulphide gas. This gas rises up to the top, condenses on the top level of the pipe where it is acted upon by sulphur oxidizing bacteria or aerobic bacteria. And this aerobic bacteria leads to the generation of sulfuric acid on the outside. Okay. So, you have acid conditions created on the crown of your pipes, whereas the submerged portion of the pipe may actually be still free from damage. Okay. So, you have essentially if you look at the cementitious material that is attacked by your biologically induced sulfuric acid attack, what you will have on the surface is a small biofilm that is formed because of the bacterial action. And then you have to a large extent formation of gypsum across a certain depth of your specimen. This gypsum formation is because of sulfuric acid attack okay. and then you have the undamaged cementitious material that is sitting inside. With time of course, what will happen is your entire cementitious nature will be lost because of the higher acidic concentration and lowering of the pH and then ultimately you will have a decomposition of your cementitious faces. So, this is again a picture from a sewer pipe on the right here you can see almost all the paste or almost all the concrete around the reinforcement is getting removed. You can barely see the reinforcement as ribs there okay, and all the concrete has got completely removed. Here again a picture from attack by muriatic acid which is basically dilute hydrochloric acid from an industry and you can clearly see the evidence of acid attack here because all the aggregates are left behind. These are siliceous aggregate, they are left behind whereas the paste has been completely dissolved away by the acid. Okay. The aggregate being silicious is not directly attacked by the acid. So, now can you tell me a mechanism of protection against acid attack? If we substitute the silicious aggregate by a carbonate aggregate, what will happen? Aggregates will also get damaged by the acid, but that is a good thing because now you have aggregate and paste that are uniformly getting damaged. So, there will be a uniform loss of cross section of your concrete. Whereas, if you use silicious aggregates, the paste gets completely dissolved away and the aggregates get loose. So, there is no binding present in the system. So, often times what people use is limestone aggregates instead of silicious aggregates because then the limestone also slowly degrades in the acidic solution. So, using limestone aggregate is a very good way of mitigating the sulfuric acid exposure or any acidic exposure. Alternatively, you can also use special cements like 
calcium aluminate cements which have very high resistance to acid attack. Okay, again this is just giving you the description of the different stages, we do not have to look at this in more detail. Uh, now there are distinctions between chemical sulfuric acid attack and organically generated sulfuric acid attack. Okay. So again the kind of products that you may form in the system and the kind of alteration of your microstructure may end up being quite different. So I am just giving you this for your information not really for uh, more discussion in this case. So sewage networks actually give you a very aggressive environment for cementitious materials. Okay, thank you.